beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Good morning, Clear Creek. We're so glad you're with us. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here too. Uh, there are probably people here who uh, have never been here before. Uh, there may be people who have never been to church before. Uh, there may be people who are coming back to church after a long time away. All of you, we want you to know we want you here. We're glad you're here. We hope you keep coming back. Uh, folks that are members of our church, look around you. Find someone that you may not know and say hello to them this morning uh, and just let them know that you're glad that they're here. A lot of good things going on at Clear Creek and I always like to start uh, every Sunday morning when I'm up here with some wins. Uh, a couple of things that I want to mention this morning that I think are, are pretty neat. You know, we, we've been doing this Power of One uh, project for several months now and it's uh, find one person and uh, that needs to know Jesus and pray for them at one o'clock every day and commit to doing this for one year. So it's one person at one o'clock for one year. And there's been a lot of prayers that have been going out. Uh, there's one person that's a special guest this morning, and I don't ordinarily do this, but we've been praying for this person who's been battling with cancer, uh, Glenda Lucas, who is one of our new members, Sherry Ellis' sister. Uh, we've been praying for her for quite some time. She is here this morning, uh, I think for the first time in a long time, and she is cancer free. So we, we want to praise God for that. We're also happy that uh, there are people that come our way that actually want to be a part of the family at Clear Creek. And, and you know, it's a, uh, this is a, a group of good people, but we're just people. And uh, I'm glad that we've got more families that continue to come in here. Um, David and Anna Scharf, their, their children, Callie and Luke, uh, would like to be a part of this congregation. We met with the elders this morning. If you're here, I know I've seen them here. So if you would, please stand up. We'd like to welcome you to the family. They're right over here. I can't wait to see what God's going to do in this uh, this couple. They're uh, they're precious people. If you don't know them, take an opportunity to try and get to know them. They're just they're great folks. Uh, I, Char family, welcome home. We're glad you're at home with us. Before we begin our lesson this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. God, our Father, we come before you humbled, knowing that you are the only God that's living, and we come here to praise you in all things. Uh, we know what it feels like to be lost. And many of us know what it's like to be found. This morning as we discuss lost, and we discuss this lost son in Luke 15, may our hearts go out to him. May we understand the love of the Father. And may we leave here knowing what Jesus is trying to tell us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. think we crashed on this place by coincidence? Especially this place? We were brought here for a purpose, for a reason, all of us. Each one of us was brought here for a reason. That's why you and I don't see eye to eye sometimes, Jack. Because you're a man of science. Yeah. What does that make you? Me? Well, I'm a man of faith. Hey, we live in a world with wreckage 
all around us. When I, when I created this video and clipped it together, I, I wanted to show the wreckage of that television show that's on ABC, uh, Lost. And to be honest with you, many people have come up to me and said, oh, how do you like that show? I've never watched it, so I don't recommend it because I've never even seen the, the show. But I, I saw this clip and I thought, man, it really applies because the truth is, with all the wreckage that is on uh, and in people's lives all around us, we're not here by accident. We're here for a reason. Uh, for many of us, it might be to encourage other people. For many of us, it might be to, uh, to lift others. There's a lot of reasons why we're here. This morning, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 15 uh, and, and talking about what it means to be lost. Luke chapter 19, in verse 10, Jesus says these words, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I hope you look at that sentence very, very carefully because it's important how it's written. What he's saying here is he's saying the Son of Man came, came to seek and to save something that was lost. But it wasn't those who are lost. It's not as simple as just people. It's about relationship. That which was lost. You know, the grand story of the scripture, if you want to put it in a nutshell, is this. That God created this perfect place with these perfect people and they chose wrong. And, and they defied God and they left God and throughout the rest of scripture until we get to the New Testament We find that there's a God who is recklessly pursuing his people He loves them so much that he continues to pursue them and continues to set these parameters for them And he he wants to have this connection this relationship with them and then in the person of Jesus Christ Who comes to earth he creates this opportunity to live with God and in Jesus Christ, he continues to recklessly pursue us so that we will not have to be lost anymore. You know, there are two places in Scripture that he uses this. He uses it in Luke 19.10, also in Matthew 18.11. He says the same thing in both places, but they're very different circumstances because they're talking about restoring relationship. Well, when we get into the book of Luke chapter 15, and we read this parable that Jesus is, is telling this group of people. There, there's, a, there's a parable of a lost coin and a parable of a lost sheep. And now we're talking about a parable of a lost son. And the parable begins this way. There was a man who had two sons. Now, if you were here the last time, two weeks ago, when I began this series, uh, you know that I understand the man that had two sons. Uh, my dad had two sons. My brother and I are very, were very, very, very different people. As a matter of fact, no one would have ever believed that we were brothers. I had someone challenge that the last time and I took him to my office and showed him a picture of my brother and I the day he graduated from high school. And they said, yeah, you're right. Y'all don't look like brothers. But I do understand the man that had two sons. Because we were so different. And as Jesus is talking to this crowd, he's talking to two totally different kinds of people. On one side over here is the group of tax collectors and sinners. They're the renegades. They're the ones that are outside of God and they know it. On the other side are the, the chief priests and the scribes, the religious people who are outside of God and have no clue. It's much like when my brother and I were small, the, the last lesson I taught, uh, I told you that we both had gotten lost in a department store as children. When I got lost, I was like the renegades. I knew I was lost. I was crying. I was searching. I wanted to find my mommy. And when we finally found one another, I never strayed too far away after that. My brother, he got lost in the same department store. And when we found him, he had crawled up in the middle of one of the beds in the bedding department and gone sound asleep. Fat, dumb, and happy, he was just so, he didn't know he was lost. And that's the crowd he's talking to here. And that's who the two sons are. You know, last week and this week, we're going to talk about the renegade son. Later in the year, because I want you to stew on this, we're going to talk about Big Brother. And so I hope you'll be looking for that sermon coming up probably this summer. But today, as we pick up, we, I want to remind you that last week we went through half of this story. And we have a son who comes to the father and he says, Father, give me what's mine. Uh, and he blows it on riotous living. And he had fallen prey to, to two concepts that we're all very familiar with. Number one, he had fallen prey to the lie of if and when. 
You know, if I can just have my money, that's when I will be happy. And all of us have probably fallen prey to the live if and when. You know, if I could just have this job, that's when I will be happy. Or if, if I could just have this house, that's when I'll be happy. Or if I could just have this car, that's when I'll be happy. Or if I could just have this relationship, that's when I will be happy. And the truth of the matter is, is that we all have what we need for happiness all along. We have Jesus Christ. And, and see, and, and we find out later in the relationship that he is there with the pigs. And he comes to his senses and he says that he will go to his father. And we talked about the power of here and now. You see, he left his home and he, what he left behind was something that most of us would trade everything for. He had a father who loved him. He had wealth to have all that he needed. He, he had position and he had a future. He had family and a future. And I know people personally that if you told them that they could have a father that loved them, enough of everything that they would ever need, a family where they belonged and were valued, and a future that was bright, they'd take that trade every day. This guy threw it all away. And he had gotten to the point where he was feeding pigs longing to eat their food. Now, I don't know if this has been lost on you before we jump in here, but a good Jewish boy hanging out with pigs is not a good thing. That was unclean. Pigs were considered unclean and awful. And that's what happens when we believe the lie of if and when. We'll fall into situations that we never dreamed would ever happen to us. No good Jewish boy would ever think he was going to wrestle pigs. But he did. The beauty of that is he comes to his senses. The beauty of that is that many times we come to our senses as well. And, and we have finally hit the bottom, wherever the bottom is for that. And for this young man, this was as far down as he could go. And he knew there was no further to fall. And the only thing that he could do was to look up. And when he looked up, the first thing that came to his mind was his father. And so he decided that he'd go home. Now... Before he went home, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Before he went home, he decided that he needed to have something to say to dad. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever been in that situation, but I told you last week that one of the relationships in my life that has really shaped me as a person was my relationship with my brother. The other is the relationship with my dad. And I can remember many times having these kinds of conversations that this, this son is wanting to have with his dad. I can remember the time that I borrowed my mother's car and didn't bring all of it home. I remember the time that we stole the Shoney's Big Boy. If you don't know who the Shoney's Big Boy is, look it up on the internet. Uh, and we put it on our high school. Uh, and I got a horrible letter from Danner Foods, and my father opened it before I got to it, saying that you better never ever do that again or else you're going to be in jail. And okay, So I haven't always been a choir boy either. Once again, I'm the renegade. And I've had these convers I know what these conversations are like. And I know what it's like to devise that speech in your brain, right? Because as a matter of fact, my life, what I do is I give speeches. I talk to people. Now, I do a lot of other things, but you know, I get paid to talk. And, and when I start thinking about devising this speech in this guy, he's sitting there saying, okay, I'm gonna go home to my dad, but I gotta tell him something, so here's what I'm gonna say. And I want to let you know, this speech is almost perfect. Almost. It's a perfect speech. Well, almost. It's 27 words. And when we look in Scripture, in Luke chapter 15, we start reading these 27 words, verses 18 and 19. He says, I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no, am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 27 words. Pretty good speech. I want us to take a few minutes and break this speech down because this speech applies to you and me. It's really about who we are and what it means for us to come home. He starts by saying, Father. 
You know, relationship's incredibly important. But earlier in this story, relationship was meaningless. You remember he said to his father, give me the inheritance that belongs to me. And what he was really saying is, dad, you're dead to me. Because that's the way inheritance works, right? Someone has to die in order for inheritance to uh, occur. And so he's saying, you're dead to me, give me what's mine. This relationship's broken. But when he comes to his senses, he says, father. I want to say to you, first thing I want to say to you, father, relationship, restoral. You know, there may be people here because I've been this person in my life who left church. When I was 18 years old, I, I left the church that I had grown up in and I left for what I thought were pretty good reasons. I, I left because the people in the church did not measure up to what I thought they ought to be. Now, I won't go into the particulars and the circumstances that took place, but I just want to let you know, leaving a church is easy. It really is. And sometimes people will leave because they haven't been treated right. And they'll, they'll have these stories of, you know, you know, I'd really like to go to church, but brother so-and-so blank. Okay. Truth is, we're all jacked up, right? Or, or I'd go back to church, but let me tell you what they did. I want to share this with you. It's easy to leave a church if your faith is in the people because they're going to disappoint you. It'll be easy to leave this church if your faith is in me because I'm going to disappoint you. But if you have the Father, leaving's not that easy. As a matter of fact, if we don't have the Father, Christianity will never work for us. You look at our mission, it's, it's up in front of you every week. We, we exist to connect people to God and to each other. And there's a reason connecting people to God is first, because it's about relationship. And this young man, when he finally hit rock bottom, and he was finally laying with the pigs, and finally stunk to high heavens, he, he realized, you know what? If I don't have father, I don't have anything. And Christians... You can talk about the church, you can talk about all the good things that are going on here, you can talk about all the programs, you can talk about children's ministry, you can talk about youth ministry, you can talk about worship, you can talk about what good elders we have, what a good staff we have, you can talk, you talk about all those things you want to talk about, but if you don't have the Father, it doesn't mean anything. And he returns and he says, Father. And then he says, I have sinned. Ha. <laughs> This is the best part of the entire speech. It really, really is. Because finally, he takes responsibility for his actions. You know, that's a hard thing to say, isn't it? I have sinned. Now, would you be willing to do an experiment with me? Just shake your heads. It's okay to shake your head in church. Would you look to someone beside you and just say, I have sinned? On three. One, two, three. Uh, Y'all can do better than that. Let's do it again. <laughs> On three, I want you to look at someone beside you and say, I have sinned. I have sinned. Is that, that's hard to say, isn't it? That was really hard to do. I thank you for, for participating in that experiment. But getting those words to roll off our tongue is tough. Why? Because we really don't want to take responsibility for things. You know, truth is, we really would like for our problems to be someone else's fault. You know, you know, I'd be okay if it weren't for so-and-so, or I'd be okay if it weren't for this situation, or I'd be okay. And sometimes we need to be people say, you know what, it's on me. It's all on me. And this guy was at the bottom, he was looking straight up, and he was saying, you know what, I need that relationship, but I have got to take responsibility for what's happened here because it's all on me. And you know, when we're people and we've been far away, Sometimes we have to realize, this is my fault. I did this. This is a, re this is, this is a, a, a part of all the choices I've made. I have sinned. And then he goes on and he qual qualifies that. 
He says, not only have I sinned, but I have sinned against heaven and against you. This is what he's going to say to his father. I've sinned against heaven and against you. And, and here's the beauty of that because he understands the reality of what sin is all about. You see, a lot of times we think that when we sin, we're not hurting anybody but ourselves. And, and sometimes that might even be kind of true, but it's not completely true. A lot of times when we sin, we leave collateral damage all around us. But we need to understand that sin also is offensive to our Father in heaven. That, that when we, we sin, we make declaration that we have judged his law and we have found it unimportant. Good example. I used this in my Wednesday night class one night. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because it would just be so embarrassing. How many of you speed when you drive a car? Okay, I'll raise my hand. Okay. You know what you do when you speed? Besides go too fast. You've taken a law and you've said, that law is unimportant. I, I, I usually like to think that, you know, if it's 55, 70 is keeping the spirit of the law. <laughs> but what you've really done is you said, that's, that's unimportant. And the people who decided that that law is real and should be there their judgment is unimportant. Well, what happens when we, we sin? What happens when, when we have, uh, have, have broken relationship with God? We say, that's unimportant. And he realizes the reality that, that this brokenness is not just about the collateral damage around us. It's about our relationship with who God really is and the holiness that he should uh, have in our lives. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And then he comes to the most real part here. He says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. <laughs> Who is? Who is? You know, it is only when we recognize that we are not worthy to be God's child that we truly understand who God really is. You, you, we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, It is by grace that you're saved not, uh, through faith, not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God, not as a result of works what any man should boast. Well, he saying? You're not worthy. We're not worthy to be called God's children. I have a son who's sitting right here. He's not worthy to be my son. I wasn't worthy to be my dad's son. In this story, the boy wasn't worthy to be the father's son. Because the truth is, I love you. This father loved his son, and God loves us for the same reason. It's all the same. And that's simply because he does, and because we're his. That's the only reason he needs. That's the only reason we need. And he comes to the reality, he says, you know what, I've broken this relationship, but I want it back. It's my fault. And I've, I've broken God's heart, I've broken your heart, and I'm not worthy, but here's the beauty. Nobody is. I just want to come home. And then this is where the speech takes a left turn. He says, make me one of your servants. Make me like one of your servants. How many of you, when you have decided to come home to God, have said, God, let me tell you how I want you to respond to my brokenness. Because that's what he's doing. He's saying, okay, Father, this is the situation. This is where we are. Now let me tell you how you're going to react. And he's dead wrong. So many times we make deals with God. God, oh, I've got this brokenness in my life, or I've got this thing going on in my life. God, if you'll just take me back, I'll blank. And that's not how God works. Man, our God's a consuming fire. Our God is a, a God who, who is sovereign, and he reacts the way he wants to, and the way he reacts is totally amazing. And it's far beyond what we would ever imagine. It's incredibly gracious. Who are we to tell God how to react to our sin? Who are we to tell God that his grace is just too good? Who are we to tell God that we're unfit for forgiveness who are we and yet this young man does that very thing he says 
relationship's broken. Let me tell you how I want you to fix it. <coughs> and we're about to find out that the father ain't buying into any of that. Here's the beautiful part of this story. He gets his speech ready. He's got these 27 words and he heads down the path. And he's about to have that speech interrupted. If, if we go back to the scripture... <laughs> verse, tw um, verse 20 he went, got up one to his father he says while he was still a long way off his father saw him was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son put his arms around him and he kissed him let that soak this is a boy who earlier had said, you're dead to me. He had taken all the money that he'd been given and he had thrown it away on bad living. And now here he is coming up the path. The father had looked for him every day. He was looking for him this day. And he sees his son a long, long way off. Here's what could have happened. He could have told his servants, you see that boy over there? Don't you let him in the gate. He's dead to me. Would he have been right? Would he have been within his rights to do that? Absolutely. He could have said, you see that boy over there, don't let him come to the main house. You take him to the servants' quarters over here. I'll deal with him later. Would he have been right? Sure. But that's not what happened. He saw him a long way off and he had compassion for him and, and, and he ran to him. Come here, son. And he ran to him and he hugged him. Oh. And the boy decides he's going to give his speech. Flush the speech up there again, Phil. And so the next verse, verse 21, and I won't make Sawyer do this because he's nervous. Hugging me was all he could stand. <laughs> and if you're visiting here, that really is my son. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's as far as he gets. That's as far as he gets. And here's the beauty of what's going on here. He, he hugs the son and he's kissing him. And I wasn't going to kiss you. That would be way too much for you, I know. <clears throat> but he hugs his son and he kisses him. And he can't stop. And it's like, oh, my son is here. And he's hugging him and he's kissing him. And he's hugging him and he's kissing him. And he's looking at him. And the boy's saying, oh, let me get my speech. Let me get my speech. And the father's saying, no, no, I don't care about your speech. As a matter of fact, the father never mentions his speech again, does he? And he, and he rolls into the speech and he says, Oh, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he grabs him and he screams, Quick! Quick! Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. <clears throat> what he's saying, he said, you know, I've got a robe behind my door. And, and you know what? It's my robe. And it's been waiting for him. And I've had it on the door because I knew he's coming home. And when he came home, that's his. I want him to be clothed like me. Galatians 3.27, when we are baptized in the Christ, we are clothed in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And he's saying, this is my boy. Clothe him like me. Give him my ring. Make him my ambassador. That's what the ring meant. It was a signet ring. And everywhere he went, if you had that ring, you could make deals and you could, you could act on behalf of the father. And he says, give him the ring. Put it on his finger. Give him the shoes. We know in Ephesians chapter 6, where Phil preached last week, we're talking about this whole armor of God, and there's these shoes that he talks about, and it's peace. And, and he says, here's what I want for my son. I don't care about his speech. I don't care about where he's been. I care about who he is to me. Clothe him with my righteousness. Don't let him be clothed with his sin. 
Put the ring on his finger so that he can represent me so that whatever has happened in his past is no longer part of his life. Put those sandals on his feet so that he can know that we're at peace. And then the next is he says, bring that fat calf. Bring the fat and calf, let's kill it, we'll have a feast and we will celebrate. And, and I can just see this son. I didn't expect this. This is not what I thought was going to happen. I thought my dad would meet me at the gate and he'd say, okay, let's hear your best story. Come on, explain yourself. And even when he tried to explain himself, he couldn't. And he jumps out and he finds out. All his dad wanted was for him to come home. That's all he wanted. All his dad wanted was to hold his son and to be in relationship with him. And you know what? That's all your God wants. I come here to declare to you this morning, grace is still amazing, that God still wants relationship with his people. And that we have an awesome God who's waiting for us to come home. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we thank you for this day, for this message. The message of an extravagant, extravagant Father. Thank you for loving us that way. It's, it, we, we pray that we'll understand this. And we'll understand why Jesus came. And it's because you wanted us to come home. And it's in your son's name we pray. And amen. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved. An alcoholic. Failure. Agnostic. Partier. Liar. Drug addict. A wretch. Like me. I once was... Broken. Resentful. Helpless. Depressed. Out of control. Abandoned. Selfish. Self-destructive. Angry. Confused. Just... Lost. But now. I'm sober. Happy. Peaceful. Grateful. Free. Alive. Forgiven. I'm found. I was blind. To God. To faith. To love. Pero ahora, yo veo. I see that I matter. I see past my problems. I see my Savior. I see grace. Amazing grace. I don't want to leave this morning until you see the most powerful character in the story. It's not the father. It is not the son. It's not the servant. And it's certainly not the pigs. It's the narrator. It's the one telling the story. Because here's the story he's saying, telling. When you want to come home, when you've hit the bottom, and you want to return to a God who is holy knowing that you're not, this is how he will receive you. He'll wrap his arms around you. He'll rejoice. Verse 24 says, And they began... To celebrate. <laughs> celebrate. Celebrate our failure. Celebrate our brokenness. Celebrate all the things that have gone wrong. No, we're going to celebrate the fact that relationship is restored. That righteousness is at hand. And that God loves us no matter what. See that story. Understand that message. This is a story, not just about a son or two, about an extravagant father, but it's a story about a savior who's telling every one of us, if you wanna come home, this is what you can expect. Sound too easy? <laughs> Argue with him, not me. I didn't make it up, I didn't write it, I'm just reporting the news. God is gracious. 
And no matter where you've been, whether you've never been to church before, you've left the church, you've left your, your, whatever it is, whatever's going on, we all got our stuff. But you can come home and we will celebrate. We encourage you to respond to the gospel. If you want to start your journey with Jesus by being baptized, we invite you to do that. If you want to come forward and have the church pray with you, we, we'd love to pray with you. We, we love you. We want to be in heaven with you. We all want that relationship with the Father. Uh, we'll have elders in room A5 and 7 across the hall who will shepherd you individually if you have that need. We just want to be an encouragement to you as you have been an encouragement to us so that we can come home and have this kind of relationship. So we encourage you to do that. While we stand, while we sing, to encourage you. My heart will sing no other name. Compares to your embrace, light of the world.